Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Shackelford. I'm a senior fellow on US foreign policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I am so pleased to be here today to discuss this riveting book. Um, and uh, what can I say? Our conversation about the world's efforts to rid Syria of chemical weapons could, could not really be better timed. Um, thank you to everybody who's joining us, especially to our members. Before we get started, I just want to note the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization, takes no institutional policy positions, so the views expressed here by participants on the program are their own. If you have a question you'd like to ask, we're taking audience questions in about a half hour at ccga.live. Simply enter ccga.live into your browser and follow the on-screen prompts to submit your questions or to vote for your favorite questions that are already listed. With that, I would like to welcome our guest today, Joby Warwick, to the conversation. Joby is a Pulitzer Prize winning national security reporter with the Washington Post and author of the newly released book, Red Line, The Unraveling of Syria and America's Race to Destroy the Most Dangerous Arsenal in the World. Even those of us who follow global events pretty closely often think back to the uh, Red Line incident and the Obama administration on Syria as a fairly straightforward story um, with some disappointments and some consequence, but this book captures the complexities of this incredibly international crisis in detail, painting a picture of just how hard it is to answer and address atrocities effectively. Uh, the characters are, I mean, you can see them. <laughs> Joby gives the reader a glimpse into the many different sides affected by this war and these decisions. Um, from diplomats struggling to use relationships to make headway against Syria's use of chemical weapons, to the crew on a ship tasked with facilitating the dangerous never before attempted effort to remove them and destroy these weapons at sea to the Syrians on the ground experiencing these really heinous attacks. It's a nail biting story. I found it fascinating um, and it was uh, really hard to put down. And as a former diplomat myself, I'm really appreciative of how he captures the promise of what diplomacy can accomplish and how important this tool is, but at the same time, how limited it is, even when you have uh, a lot of international interest in a, in a target. So um, I've encouraged Joby to start with a brief excerpt to demonstrate the stakes here and to bring you right to the heart of the story. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Welcome, Joby. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much. And thanks for doing this. I want to thank the, the, the council and everybody who's attending today and also uh, please encourage all of you to be sure to get uh, Lizzie's uh, terrific book, The Descent Channel. I congratulate you for that and also for, uh, for your new position at the council. So I know everybody's really excited to have you with us. So I'm going to just read a snippet because uh, reading on Zoom is, is, is boring, but I, I've got just a little bit of a, a character sketch that I'd like to share with you. To set this up, this is in August 2013. There's been this horrific chemical weapons attack in the suburbs of Damascus. There happened to have been a team of UN inspectors on the ground at the time for the purpose of investigating these small chemical weapons attacks that had taken place over the past year. So they're in the ground, they see the attack from afar when it's happening, and then they, after several days of wrangling and international pressure, they get permission to go to the scene to see if they can collect vital evidence. I mean, the world is convinced that an atrocity has happened. They want to see exactly what kind of chemicals were used, if they can figure out who, who had used it, and so it's a vital mission for them. They get permission, but they're told they have to go unarmed on their own, crossing into, through no man's land into rebel territory. And so that's where we are from this little snippet begins. At 1 p.m. on August 26, the UN team was ready. Five armored SUVs with giant UN markings set out from central Damascus and onto a nearby empty highway headed toward the, to the southwest. Leader Eke Selstrom had chosen as his first stop the town of Monamia one of the rebel-held suburbs hit by chemical weapon shells. The distance from the hotel was only seven miles by car, and the security team had predicted a journey of less than 30 minutes, but nothing on this day would go according to plan. The vehicles had crossed into no man's land and were approaching a small bridge when something struck the lead vehicle on its passenger side. From inside the car, the sound was like a small rock smacking against metal at high speed. Pop, a second impact. These weren't rocks. More bullets hit the lead SUV, puncturing two tires and smashing against the side window. Then the windshield took a direct hit. 
The bulletproof glass was holding up so far, but each impact left a spider web of tiny lines that were now starting to spread. Another shot or two, and the glass would almost certainly fail. We're moving back to our rally point, the mission security chief, Dermot O'Donovan, called out on his radio. The convoy reversed course and roared back in the direction of Damascus. The damaged car, with its blown tires, limped along on its reinforced rims, but all vehicles made it back to a Syrian army outpost. Then they stopped to regroup. O'Donovan and his deputy, Mohammed Kafaji, got out of their SUV and walked over to Selstrom's car in their body armor and helmets. The Swede rolled down his window. Kafaji was most familiar with the local situation, so Selstrom turned to him with his most pressing question. What do we do, Mohammed? he asked. Kafaji didn't hesitate. We go in again, he said. What? Selstrom was incredulous. If we don't go today, we'll never go, Kafaji said. They'll know that they can frighten us and your mission will be over. O'Donovan reflected for a moment, then nodded his approval. Going back would be risky, but those dangers had to be weighed against what seemed to be a genuine opportunity, a chance to accomplish what they had come to Syria to do. Selstrom sat quietly thinking. He was being asked to send his team back down a road where a waiting sniper was merely the only threat of which they were absolutely certain. Okay, he said, we go in. Moments later, the four undamaged SUVs lined up for a fresh attempt to cross into rebel territory. This one would look very different. Rather than cautiously feeling their way across no man's land, they would dash across it like inmates on a prison break. Kafaji grabbed a spare armored jacket and scooting down into a seat, used his feet to press it up against the windshield. Team members in the other cars did the same. When everyone was ready, the SUVs passed to the checkpoint and then tore down the narrow road with as much speed as the drivers could muster. The vehicle shot across the bridge and did not slow until all were on the other side. This time, no shots were fired. It's so tense. And that's this book. It's really remarkable um, how how high energy and, and tension he can you, you maintain in, throughout this throughout this book. Um, it reads like uh, an exciting movie, but is all very, very real to life. Um, I'm going to remind everybody here watching that we've got a link to uh, to purchase Joby's book in the chat function. So please pick it up. You will not regret it. Uh, so Joby, I'd like to just start with a couple of contextual questions, you know, just briefly to set the scene. Um, can you give us a little overview of the state of play in Syria today and what has changed and what hasn't changed since, you know, this period in your book wraps up around 2018? Well, what has changed is that Assad has prevailed. It's been 10 years. It'll be actually 10 years in, in about two weeks that the uprising began. And incredibly, it, it's still going on, but it's essentially over. We have uh, opposition forces kind of cornered to a small area of, of Syria to the northwest. Um, in the east, we have kind of a, you know, there's a mix of uh, Kurdish fighters. ISIS is still active in various areas, but Assad has survived. And there are consequences of that, and we'll, we're going to be dealing with that for years and years. But the, but the, the essential thing, I think, going forward, and I think the, the Biden folks know this, is there is an important role for the United States to play. There's certainly a diplomatic role. I think, in a way, we've disengaged diplomatically over the last few years, allowing the Russians to, to dictate terms and how, how, the, how the conflict was going to be settled. Uh, we'd long ago sort of abandoned any idea of a, of a significant military engagement, so that's not going to happen. But the role for the United States is to, is to try to uh, construct an outcome that will be acceptable to the side, that will bring all sides, that will bring stability, uh, that will uh, allow our neighbors to hopefully breathe a sigh of relief because it's been a difficult time for all the neighbors. Uh, but, but most importantly, to prevent bad things from reasserting themselves. We still have the possibility of an ISIS resurgence in, in the East. We have you know, an Iran with very significant ambitions in Syria and much more say so because Assad essentially owes them um, uh, his survival. And there are now uh, militia groups aligned with Iran that um, populate the entire region of southern, um, southern Syria and other areas as well. And there's also, you know, there's just a need for the United States to be engaged uh, in multiple levels, because if we don't, things could get much worse for our own interest and also for the region. I definitely want to dive into a little bit of, you know, more of where we where we are today and, and, and what lessons we can take from what happened before with what the Biden administration might do moving forward. But before we jump into that, I want to I want to talk a little bit about chemical weapons, uh, which are, of course, 
almost a character in the book themselves. Um, they are such a, a, a fixation point. Um, and the book draws out the urgency that the international community has in addressing chemical weapons specifically, um, even while many other weapons are being used to such lethal effect. What makes chemical weapons such you know, a particularly heinous uh, tool that, that has this higher level of international fixation? And um, you know, what do you think about the focus on that over the focus on something like ending the war? Hmm. Oh, we're absolutely right about that. And I think many Syrians would uh, would express frustration and perhaps anger over the fact that everyone in the world seems to focus on this one weapon when in fact Syrians are dying all kinds of horrible ways and continue to do so. Chemical weapons are different in our history. And in part because of the history of the West, we had an experience a century ago in World War I when chemical weapons were used and the results were so you know, viscerally horrible, I mean, for the world to watch, that we decided collectively to ban them. It's the first weapon system that the world got together, signed a treaty and said, no more. Nobody's going to use these weapons again ever. Countries have to sign a treaty. We have to agree to inspections. We have to, to not use them. And so that was the norm uh, with a few violations over the century. And then here comes Syria that decides to very flagrantly violate that taboo. So we have a couple of things going on. First, the, the West in particular, and other countries as well, saw this as a moment to stand firm on our prohibition, on our taboo, to do something about chemical weapons, even though we did manage to, to, to find a way to address the other problems in the war itself. And secondly, they are you know, really horrible weapons and, and more lethal than the others that we see Syrians using every day. Uh, that this one day, August 21st, 2013, when just a few artillery shells filled with sarin landed in suburbs of Damascus, we saw 1,400 people killed, according to an American count. That today is the single most deadly day in the entire 10 years. So that shows you that the killing power of these weapons. The other concern is frankly for non-Syrians, because unlike some of the other weapons that, that might leak out of the country, small arms, maybe some artillery rockets. If, if you get out of the country with a few liters of sarin, you have in your hand an incredibly dangerous terrorist weapon. And that was the stakes in Syria. You had a country that was falling apart. And this country, unlike all the other countries of Arab Spring, had a, had a weapon of mass destruction within its borders and not in one place, but spread out all over the country. And those stockpiles were incredibly vulnerable to plundering. And so that's one of the reasons that the Obama administration in deciding its Syria policy wanted stability for the country, but their other big objective was to make sure those weapons weren't used and to get them out if they possibly could. So, and you, you've you alluded to this, but you know, given that how, how unique these weapons are for, for those reasons, um, what do you think with hindsight was really the effect of you know, the US, the Obama administration making, you know, drawing this red line so famously and then backing away from it. Because as you said, this was breaking with, you know, kind of what was internationally accepted, but we have seen changes in kind of how chemical weapons and, you know, on small scales and, and larger scales have been toyed with uh, since that time. So what do you think that the real effect is kind of on the global stage of that, of backing away from that threat? Well, I think it's it, it was a humiliating moment for the Obama administration because that red line had been so explicitly drawn. But to give a little context to why those words red line were uttered in 2012, there was a moment in the conflict around the summer of 2012 when intelligence services were seeing some very bad things happening. They were seeing movement of chemical weapons. They were being taken out of their bunkers. And there was... Um, pretty compelling evidence from the Israelis that, that Assad was about to give some of these to Hezbollah, the, the Lebanese militia right next door, uh, a militia group with thousands of artillery rockets aimed at Israel. And so the fear was that if Hezbollah gets this sarin and this VX and all these other things, this is a game changer for the Middle East. And so you see U.S. diplomats going around the world, you know, Bill Burns talking to the Russians, uh, you know, back channel meetings with Iranians, meetings with the Syrians to tell them, don't do this, don't give away the weapons, don't use the weapons. And Obama and Hillary Clinton both came out and, and made strong statements of this kind. And in one particular uh, press conference, uh, saw, uh, Obama was asked about this, and he used this phrase, this very you know, loaded phrase, a red line. If, if Assad uses these weapons, it's going to be a red line for us. 
And so the impact of that actually immediately was the activity stopped. So the things we saw that we're worried about in 2012, they went away for a while. But then months later, you start to see Assad using these weapons again, a little pinprick here, a little bit there, and then this massive attack in 2013 that everyone felt compelled to respond to. And so the US had to figure out what is the response. Initially, it was going to be a military strike. That was uh, what Obama initially wanted to do. He had the plans in the works. He was uh, making preparations. The ships were in place. There were, there were problems. There were intelligence problems. We had to make sure that our, our intelligence on the use of WMD was absolutely certain because we'd gotten into a war before over, over a WMD controversy. So we didn't want that to repeat. There were inspectors in the country and Obama wanted to get them out before he fired missiles. And, and as time went on, the momentum started to, to ebb and, and, and you know, Obama decided to go to Congress and ask if they would support a strike and they didn't. So we were, we were left with really nothing until this deal came. Out of the blue, the Russians proposed a settlement in which we could get the weapons out. So Obama has been criticized. There's this sense, especially in the region, that, that the United States lost credibility. I think history shows that it was a, a complete loss because we did punish Assad to the extent that this is his strategic stockpile. These weren't just random weapons. They were the crown jewel of, of, of Syria's military establishment. He lost them. He lost nearly all of them, 90, 95% of his stockpile, plus all his manufacturing equipment. So that, that went away. And that's a pretty significant punishment. And the other thing is we did achieve this objective of eliminating or mostly eliminating this, this strategic regional threat. And, and so it wasn't a complete loss. Um, I think Obama probably wishes he could use, <laughs> rephrased his red line statement a little bit, um, but it, it did, I think uh, it disappointed the uh, Syrian opposition, certainly that we didn't respond more forcefully. And for countries in the region, there was a sense that we had not kept our word. We had not done the thing we'd said we were going to do. Yeah, the, the book does a really great job of, of, of detailing this painstaking process of, of achieving you know, exactly what you're talking about, this securing this international agreement, getting serious buy-in to destroy the crown jewel of their, uh, their stockpiles, and uh, you know, how they you know, deploying this international team on the ground, then rapidly developing an entire system to transport and destroy the weapons. I mean, it's, it's remarkable what's achieved, especially when you think about you know, how slow these types of things with international organizations in the UN usually go. Um, so that's, you know, it, it's remarkable, but, um, but at the same time, you're contrasting these wins with the disappointment that you have of the suffering of the Syrian people who saw this as this promise that something was going to be done. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as we said, that something at the end of the day is, is not enough for the Syrian people. So I'd love to hear you talk just a little bit about what factors align to make this remarkable international achievement possible. And then, and then you know, we can talk about the, the kind of flip side, that the wins first and then the disappointments. Sure. And any listeners who were involved in international organizations, uh, the UN, even uh, uh, American uh, agencies and departments, getting any big bureaucracy to mobilize quickly, it, it just doesn't happen. Uh, there was technology that had to be invented for this. There was no ready-made machine that could go someplace like Syria and, and eliminate a chemical weapon stockpile. There was no agency that does this. Where do you go in the world to find you know, a team that's going to parachute into a country in the middle of civil war and oversee the destruction of, of an arsenal? It, it just doesn't, didn't exist. So that had to be created. So sort of the legality, so sort the of framework had to be passed and all actually occurred in a single day, a, a UN Security Council resolution and an OPCW resolution to allow this to happen. And you had inspectors in the ground from, you know, within two and a half weeks of the deal being struck, you had boots on the ground with UN OPCW people starting the mission, starting to go into uh, to Syria to, to look for, for these weapon systems. It, it, in hindsight, it's just incredible that that happened at all. And even more, you know, it, amazing to me is that it then succeeded in its declared mission. Uh, a deadline was set, was set of getting rid of the entire declared stockpile and production system in nine months, nine months. And a third country that is at war, an active war with, with you know, often sometimes trucks, you know, driving down highways with, with artillery shells going overhead, I mean, that kind of fighting going on. And, and yet in nine months, all 1,300 tons that we knew about in Syria at the time were either sitting at the docks at Latakia on the, on the coast of, of Syria or already out in sea and waiting to be destroyed. So we can 
and we will in a moment talk about the failures and the shortcomings, the stuff we missed, um, the greater failure of Syria policies, which is just enormous, and that's the big court, the elephant in the room. But as a feat of disarmament, there's nothing else that's been like this. A, a, an entire stockpile and a very big one and a very dangerous one removed from a country in the middle of a war by organizations that didn't exist before. And with that part alone is, is just a remarkable story. And I think it's one of the most amazing feats of arms control of our modern times. It is a remarkable story and you tell it so well and in such detail. And you know, as, as you said in your, in your uh, excerpt that you read earlier, I mean, the, the bureaucrats putting themselves out there in a, a war zone. I mean, I've, I've worked with the UN in war zones. It's, none of this usually goes that smoothly. Uh, so it, it is amazing, which is part of why it's so heart-wrenching to kind of look at the flip side and some of the, you know, the Syrian characters that you, I mean, real people that you bring to life in the pages of your book, like, you know, Chemical Hazem and, and others who are just working with practically no resources, risking their lives to save victims, to capture evidence of these crimes. And for me, that was one of the most heart-wrenching parts is you've got Syrians risking their lives to collect very dangerous evidence. And then at the end of the day, at least from their perspective, they're thinking, what was that all for? They feel <laughs> left out in the cold. So um, you know, what what lessons do you take from, from that contrast? And what do you think the um, you know, I mean, Biden administration has a lot of officials who, who are returning, who were involved in this at the time. And you know, what lessons do you think that they might be taking moving forward? And, and you know, how might this, you know, how might they be able to do something better for you know, the Syrian people this time around? Well, you're absolutely right about the, the bitter disappointment that this was from the, the optic of, of Syrian opposition leaders and activists and others who expected that okay, well, the United States is finally gonna respond. They're gonna do it because of chemical weapons, but at least they're responding. But the response was, was quite different from what they expected. The suffering continued. Assad remained in power. And, and as far as they're concerned, he was in power because we legitimized him in some way and, and, and made him part of a, a UN you know, process, which they, they, they find just, just galling. And uh, one of my favorite characters, characters in the book is uh, a, a Dutch diplomat named Sigrid Kog who was plucked out of, out of the UN to lead this disarmament mission, having had no experience with chemical weapons, no experience really with, with military affairs, and yet she's thrown into this <laughs> mission impossible to try to eliminate these weapons. And she gets it done, and she's kind of sitting back and having you know coffee with one of her friends after it's over, and she says, you know, I hope the Syrian people can forgive us because we didn't change their lives. We, we did this one thing we came in and said we we're going to do, but we didn't really affect, we didn't really save anyone except for those that might have died in chemical weapons attack. So in that sense, it was, it was a great disappointment. And I see, I think one of the lessons that have been drawn, and, and you won't hear many of them talk about this publicly, but the folks who were veterans of this mission back in 2013, 14, and we're back now, one of the lessons they learned is is about this this perception of 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 this of you know the U.S. cavalry coming to the rescue, and the, the the extent to which we encourage that, even you know back in 2011 when Obama uh, you know spoke the words Assad must go, it, it seemed harmless at the time. You know, the United States was taking sides with with people who were uh, advocating for democracy in, in, the, in the countries of Arab Spring and Egypt and, and Libya and other places. And one by one, you know, U.S. officials would stand up and say, you know, you know, Gaddafi must go, uh, uh, you know, Mubarak must go, and Assad must go. But those sounded like just wonderful platitudes from our ears. But but for the Syrians, there was a promise there, a, a commitment that we were on their side and we were going to see somehow that they prevailed. And it was the same with the Red Line statement. There was a, a sense again and again, we promised a lot. And, what, and yet we didn't really back it up. We weren't willing ever, and perhaps you know, people can argue that whether we should have been, ever really committed to having a significant military engagement in, in Syria. That just wasn't gonna happen. And, but, but the expectation was there. Our allies expected it. They made their bets accordingly. And you know, when it didn't happen, you see this frustration and then a lot of people on the Syrian side saying, well, the West is not really gonna help us. Who else can we turn to? And they turn to ISIS, they turn to Al-Qaeda, Tal-Nusra, and other groups that had money and had 
um, you know, ambitions to take over the country. And so they, they felt like, well, 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 we don't need the West. They're not going to help us anyway. So here's another plan. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really interesting to contemplate the power of words in that, in, in those scenarios, right? We often look at diplomacy and, and wonder how, how, um, how much uh, influence it can have, but even just these words spoken by American leaders had such influence on the ground. And then when we didn't follow up with action, you know, it did have it did have consequences that had consequences. So, and as you mentioned, you know, ISIS and its reemergence, you know, during all of this is um, an interesting consequence of some prior American foreign policy decisions. Um, and uh, another big part of what you know, of what you discuss is the, the train and equip program where we're assisting Syrian rebels trying to decide between the good and the bad Syrian rebels and, and how that gets out of whack because that program is, is you know, kind of corrupted and not well managed and, and where that ends up. So I guess a, kind of a, a bigger version question for me here is, you know, what part did US policies and decisions play not, not just in kind of decisions not to do things, but how did we contribute to mucking up this situation through you know, kind of best laid plans and, and um, our, our efforts to do things somewhat less than, than that strike? That's a, that's a really good point. And this is a, a difficult part to report. A lot of these programs are still classified. So, so there's limits to what you can say about them. But I found this part of the story fascinating because there's, there's this critique that the Obama administration really did nothing for the rebels. What well, turns out, they did a lot. They spent a billion dollars on a classified training and equip program that has remained under wraps. It's called Operation Temper Sycamore. Um, and, and it actually was a response to chemical weapons violations because before the big attack in 2013, there were these small attacks. The US concluded they were real, that the sarin had been used. It was a crossing of the red line. And so Obama's initial response was, okay, you know, he was reluctant at first, but let's provide lethal aid to the, to the Syrian rebels. That's hard to do because, you know, while we think of the rebels as being some kind of unified, you know, body of, you know, freedom fighters that are, you know, led by George Washington, the reality is that besides, you know, a, a front office, you know, so political leadership that, that goes to Geneva meetings, the reality in the ground are there are hundreds and hundreds of little groups and they all have tribal allegiances or neighborhood allegiances. Some are like neighborhood watches, others, have you know pretty you know clear ties to Islamists and folks that we don't really want to be involved in. And so when you're in the business of trying to pick people to train and give weapons to, it gets really complicated. And we certainly tried. We spent a lot of money. We developed training camps in Turkey. We brought tens of thousands of people into Turkey for training and then sent them back across the border. And the outcome was was well, disappointing to say the least. A lot of the fighters you know ended up you know joining the other side, you know, whoever was paying them more money or had better guns. So they joined the you know, Al-Nusra or some of the other organizations. A lot of our best weapon systems simply vanished once they were across the border. And so by by end of Obama's term, it was pretty clear that this, this massive investment in, uh, in arms and training didn't really achieve anything. It did bring some military gains in, in the 20, late 2014-2015 period, but they were gains by al-Nusra and, and others that were aligned with terrorist groups. And in, in the White House, you could see this fear starting to settle in where they realized that, well, well, maybe these rebels will be successful, but which ones? And there was this talk about this catastrophic success scenario where we, where we succeed in overthrowing Assad, but who takes its place? You know, some, some really bad guys. And we became extremely worried about that. We didn't have to worry in the long run because 20, 2015 was also when the Russians got involved militarily. And once the Russians started to throw their weight into it, uh, the tide of battle changed pretty quickly and, and Assad never, never lost ground after that. I feel like it's such a lesson in, in, again, best laid plans and how little that we can control, you know, as the United States when we're trying to have influence um, in, in other places where there are so many moving parts as there were here. Um, I want to remind people that uh, you can go, any, anyone watching here can go to ccga.live and add some questions to the queue. I'm going to shift now from my millions of questions that I have for Joby to pull in some from, from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll start with the question that we've gotten um, from a couple of folks. Uh, how instrumental was American leadership 
in disarming uh, Syrian chemical weapons. I mean, it's obviously a very international effort, uh, which is successful, but how, how much was the US in the lead in that? And what role yeah. did we play? That's a good question. And I, the, the subtitle is, is America's Race to Destroy This Arsenal. It, it's a bit, um, I say this diplomatically, I, I don't know that I would have put America in it um, because it was truly an international effort. And, and it was in many ways led more by the UN and by the OPCW than, than folks back here in Washington. But the American role was, was quite significant because there's certain things that really only America can do. And logistically, once this operation started, it was everything from you know, supplying money, supplying vehicles, uh, you know, for transporting chemicals across the country, to, you know, a laboratory analysis, and then the, the big item, the most expensive item, was a, you know, a means of destroying the chemicals once you got them out of the country. Because there was a big discussion, okay, oh, so we get this stuff out of Syria, we're going to not let it stay in Syria a day longer than we can, we're going to get it out. But once you get it out, where does it go? Well, no country wanted 1,300 tons of chemical weapons taken into one of their harbors. I mean, we literally went around the world and asked everybody. We went to Albania. We tried to pressure them because they were trying to join NATO at the time. And don't you want these chemical weapons? We'll build you a facility that's going to be great. And, and they were about to do it. And then the word leaked out. And so there were protests on the street. And they declined. And so in the end, nobody could do it but America. And our only option really was to do it on a ship because we couldn't bring it back to our shores either. And so we took this machine that we had built that came together in a few months for a few million dollars, bolted it onto the, to the deck of an old cargo vessel and sent a team out to pick up the, the chemicals. And then for 40 days, do circles around the Mediterranean while they're destroying these weapons on, on the ship. And uh, if you read the book, you'll see that it gets extremely interesting as they do this because First of all, there's, you know, alarms being raised across Southern Europe and people are worried about, you know, dumping of chemicals in the Mediterranean. So you see environmentalists organize and, and send flotillas out to try to stop the ship in the middle of the sea. You see, uh, you know, machines breaking down. You see um, this really scary problem where this, this ship starts to become less and less stable because it's burning off fuel. The fuel is ballast, it's down the bottom. They're moving more and more waste products to the upper deck. And they have a computer program where, can, where they could see if the, if the ship is stable and it's becoming more and more unstable, getting to the point where you know, a big wave or you know, you know, some other accident could make the ship capsize. So we have all this drama that's going on uh, and yet they get it done. And, and it's really a testament to American know-how and, and guys, again, normal everyday bureaucrats and technicians and scientists who put together this program in no time, spent a ton of money and, and managed to make it work. And, and, and at times like this, we really are a country of one in the world because there's, there's no other country literally that could have done this in the way we did. I have to say that that storyline was one of the most surprising of, of many surprising storylines in the book because it, it, you, you aren't expecting it, you aren't seeing it coming. You're not expecting these characters that, that you've, you're talking about this you know, ship crew and the captain and and the how mundane so much of their existence in this time is when they're doing something that could couldn't be further from mon mundane. Um, mm -hmm. So it's 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 a very interesting read and it reminds you of that whole you know not in my backyard NIMBY nature of you know towns discussing where you put the cell phone tower, but this time it's where you get rid of these incredibly dangerous weapons. Um, so it's <clears throat> you know, I, I do think that's uh, a part that people know very little about and it, it, you just bring all of the bureaucracy of it uh, to light um, in a way that's really a compelling story, more compelling than most UN bureaucracy type things are. Um, so we've got a, another question actually on to that effect, which you've, you've talked a little bit about, but you know, how do you dispose of these chemical weapons? You don't, don't need to go into like deep detail, but, but you know, there's this whole explanation in the, sh in this, in the book of, of how they figure out how to do this on, on a moving ship. And um, it was, can you just talk briefly about, you know, how, how they managed to actually destroy the weapons? Yeah. And a good thing about being a layman um, is that I, I don't, my technical knowledge is not deep enough that I can really bore people with it. 
but but in the beginning, you know, we've actually destroyed chemical weapons before. We used to have a massive stockpile in this country, and it's taken us two decades and oh, I don't know what the, the latest price tag is, but billions and billions and billions of dollars to destroy our own stuff, and we're still not done all these years later. So the technology is typically burning. You, you build an incinerator, but of course that creates environmental waste. So you have to have you know, regulations and scrubbers and things like that. You can't do that on a boat. And so what they came up with, it turns out that you can destroy you know, the, the, the essential products of sarin using this mechanical process that involves plain water because water, it turns out, reacts with, with sarin, uh, which breaks it down into other kinds of products that are still toxic, but they're not sarin, it's irreversible change. And so if you, the beauty of this machine was it could take this bad stuff and you know, put it through pipes and pumps and essentially eject streams of bad chemicals and water together under certain controlled conditions and then put it in different vats for further treatment. So it's all kind of very mechanical. Um, and so the chemistry is, is not that challenging, but it's just a matter of somebody had to invent it because we never really had a system quite like this before. And the, the cool thing is that once you got it on a boat and once the process starts rolling, then it's just a matter of, of just one barrel at a time, just rolling the bad stuff up to this machine and guys working around the clock under just really horrific conditions, hot, you know, no, no alcohol, no, you know, no R and R breaks, just, just working their tails off for 40 days. And one by one by one, you can see that the number of, of barrels of the bad stuff going down and down and down until finally they got rid of the last one and it was done. Yeah. It's, then you it's have to drop wonderful. it off. Someplace. I mean, it's wonderful how, how, like you said, you, you come and edit as a lay person and you're able to describe it in a very, very understandable way. Um, that breaks down this complex thing into something that a bunch of dudes on a boat are doing. Um, and, and wrapping in those really interesting um, kind of political questions, you mentioned that they don't have r rs and it's because they're, you know, it's because it would send the wrong signal diplomatically to, you know, to Syria or Russia if, if they were allowed to take a break and leave the boats. So, and it's, um, the la layers of complication were really fascinating. Uh, we've Got a few more minutes. I'm going to try and get to a couple more of our audience questions. Uh, one that I think is uh, it's a very interesting question, and you you take it on somewhat towards the end of the book. But you know, did Donald Trump's decision to engage militarily through airstrikes, uh, which was a shift from what Obama had decided not to do, did that alter the course of conflict? Mm -hmm. And I'll just add on for myself. Um, you know, did what the Obama administration do alter the course of the conflict? And now will what Biden's doing with the recent airstrikes make any difference? Mm. It's a really good question. And, you know, as our listeners and viewers will, will remember, you know, Trump got, Trump got a lot of praise in 2017 and in 2018 when he decided that he would respond to violations of the red line with a military strike. And he was fairly quick about it. Um, got a lot of praise internationally as well as within, you know, members of his own party. But what you can do now in, in, in hindsight is compare the responses. And one reason we can compare them fairly well is because uh, Trump's initial airstrike in 2017 was pretty much the same plan that Obama had in mind in, in 2013 when the initial attack was planned. Um, what's important about it is it was punitive. It wasn't a, an attempt to decapitate. Um, Assad. It wasn't an attempt to get rid of his chemical weapon stockpile because you can't, turns out you can't bomb chemical weapons. It's a very dangerous thing to do. You're just going to release some of them. You'll probably end up killing civilians. And then then we've killed people with chemical weapons and, and not just Assad. So you could just imagine how bad that would have been. So that was off the table. We, we weren't looking for a, a broader impact. We were just looking to punish Assad. And it turns out, okay, well, in 2017, we hit uh, one airway, one, one essentially air facility that the, the, the Assad had. We destroyed some planes and some hangars. We put some craters in their runway. Uh, the next day, in fact, even before a day was out, Syria was flying planes off the same runway again and carrying out their sorties. So it wasn't much of a punishment in the sense that Assad didn't lose very much. And then he continued chemical weapons attacks again. So it didn't deter him. And even after 2018, which was a little bit more of an aggressive airstrike, uh, John Bolton in his, his recent book acknowledges that we didn't stop the intention. Whenever Assad could, thought he could get away with using chemical weapons, he used them again. And so each one of these actions, Obama's, Trump's two strikes, ended up having a temporary deterrent effect. But it didn't solve the problem. It didn't end the war. 
It um, arguably Obama's did achieve a, a removal of a strategic stockpile. And even if you don't get all of it, you've destroyed his production equipment. So you've made it really, really hard for him to ever make this stuff again. And so that way, you know, in that sense, it was a, a bigger win. But I think in, in both cases, we didn't solve the problem. And so, so you know, it, it, you can look at both instances and see that they weren't, they weren't perfect answers to this, this, uh, this problem that we had. Yeah, unfortunately, there is no perfect answer um, that we can see right now to this situation. Um, but one question that we've gotten from, um, from the audience is to what extent did Obama's red line and Western inaction become a tool of radicalization and recruitment for groups such as ISIS? There's no question about that. That one of the one of the, the big negatives of, of not striking in 2013 is that you almost see the light turn off um, in, in within the opposition. That there had been this frustration up until that point, that from 2011 to 2013, a hope that the United States would get involved, a hope that we would arm the rebels and give them military aid in a significant way, and more importantly, that we would take out Assad's air power, that we would have a, a no-fly zone, all these things that they were hoping we'd do, we would do, and we didn't. Here was the moment when everybody thought, my gosh, if, if the United States is ever going to do anything, they're going to do it now. And when we didn't, just you, you can see it in the characters in my story where they just, they, they, they erupt in rage. They, they feel at this one guy who's, uh, uh, who was an activist at the time, and he just he just really, really thought that this was going to be this is going to be the turning moment. He was in, in Ghouta, where the chemical weapons attack took place in 2013. He was physically injured by the attack, and, but he was sure that this was going to be, uh, you know, the, the, a change now that, that we were really going to do something. And when we didn't, it just the bitterness takes over, and all his friends are saying, you know, forget about the West, forget about the United States. We got to do this ourselves. And the only way to do it really is with uh, these guys who have all the money and the, and, the, and the military experience, the ISIS guys. And you could see them you know, having a heyday with this in terms of recruitment and, and being able to get people to join their side. Well, I, um, I can't believe it. We're already reaching the end of our time here. So um, Joby, I'd like to give you one, uh, before I totally wrap up, just one chance for what, you know, what takeaway message do you most want your readers to take from, from this book? Hmm. Well, I hope they, they can appreciate this story because it is, in many ways, it is a collection of stories with really interesting characters who are trying to do their job under very difficult circumstances. And so I hope you'll, you'll find that engaging and also just the, the complexity of the, of the policy piece um, hopefully is laid out in a way that it, it makes sense. But what, what comes away and what you'll get as the book ends is the sense that no matter what we did, um, you know, the, the things that we did that were, were right, the things that we did that, that failed. The ultimate the problem with Syria is, is, is we did not obtain accountability for the guys that carried out these horrific war crimes and that the, the taboo has been eroded. You see now in the last uh, three, four years, North Korea and Russia both carrying out chemical weapons attacks as assassination tools outside their borders. So there's a sense that, that uh, these, these other countries have been emboldened because Assad to this day has never been forced to admit that, yeah, I did this. He's never been brought to a, a, a criminal court or even held to serious sanction other than the step we typically do against Syria to, to, to pay a price himself and his family for this incredible act of, of, of extreme violence against his own people. And that is the legacy I think that, that stays with us and continues to haunt us as we try to figure out what to do in this very difficult region. I think it's it's notable not only that we've been seeing you know, Biden administration action on Syria, but your uh, point of accountability rings true with so many of our foreign policy and domestic policy issues that we're seeing right now. Um, so I think that's a that's a great a great point to wrap up on, and I, I certainly read that myself in the book and appreciated the the attention that you drew to it. I just want to encourage everybody to pick this book up if you're looking for both a great story, a winter weather escape, and a way to get really smart on these issues that just lay out in such interesting, uh, colorful detail these strange, challenging policy issues. You know, you can't pick a better read for that. Uh, Joby's writing makes you feel like you're there. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to dive into this topic for us so that we can learn a lot about it. As a reminder, there's gonna be a recording of this conversation that will be available on the council's social channels and the website shortly. 
Thank you all for joining us here today. And thank you so much, Joby, for the conversation. It's been really a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.